Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to CIBC Presents Entrepreneurship 101. Uh, I do want to mention we have a uh, special sponsor for tonight, the, uh, the J.P. Bickle Foundation, which was uh, created by John Paris Bickle in 1951. Uh, interesting, they um, are a strong supporter of sick kids. Uh, and um, provide a variety of scholarships and bursaries. Um, and we're delighted that they have seen fit to uh, extend their support to this program, uh, a, a variant form of education, if you will. And uh, so we're delighted to have them as a sponsor. Um, I know many of you want to know what's happening with the Upstart competition. Um, haven't yet finished doing the review of the 22 submissions. Um, I hope to have an answer for you as to who, who, you know, the 12 that will be continuing on for the competition by next Wednesday. Uh, this entails nagging a number of my colleagues to actually meet with you, uh, and so I'm trying to get them to, to fit you into their busy schedules. I ask that you be as cooperative as possible. If they give you a time window, please do try and be there, uh, because I rely on their opinions, and so you know, I'm trying to, I've tried to match each opportunity up with someone with relevant domain expertise uh, to help us make that cut from 22 to 12. So uh, rest assured, both those going ahead and those not will be contacted as soon as, as I possibly uh, can, okay? So, uh, tonight's talk. It is somewhat ironic that we have a charitable foundation sponsoring uh, tonight's talk, uh, and we have three venture capitalists on the stage. Um, now, I'm not saying that venture capitalists are uncharitable, but I was casting around trying to think of what is the collective noun uh, for venture capitalists, and is it a you know a bloodthirst of venture capitalists? Or I'm, I'm, I, and I say this because these guys know that I am in fact a recovering venture capitalist myself. Um, our host tonight, our moderator, is Peter Tolnoy, uh, who has been a uh, an active participant in Mars in general and in this course in the past. Peter um, is the founder and president of Orchard Capital Group. Uh, uh, but Peter and I uh, are, I think, both embarrassed to admit that we go back to a time when he was at uh, Helix Investments, which has to be the, the, probably the original venture fund in Canada. And to put a date on it, Helix Ben Webster, who was the founder of Helix, actually uh, uh, took um, Velcro to the marketplace. So that'll give you a sense <laughs> both of uh, the power of that fund and also its age. Uh, so Peter will be acting as our, um, as our moderator tonight. Uh, and, and we have two panelists, uh, one Michael Midmer, uh, who again, many of you here in Mars will, will know Mike, Michael uh, from his office up on the, the first floor. Michael is with, uh, is a director of Rosetta Capital. Um, uh, and he has uh, been a biz dev manager at KS Biomedics, uh, worked at Cardiome Pharma in, uh, in Vancouver, um, and uh, comes uh, uh, from the, uh, came, uh, to Cardium from BMO Nesmith Burns. So uh, both a, a strong science background as well as a, an MBA from Imperial College. And joining Michael on the panel, I'm delighted to, uh, to welcome Chris Arsenault. Uh, again, I've known Chris for a number of years. Uh, he was one of the founders of a fund uh, originally called MSBI, the MSB standing for McGill, Sherbrooke, and Bishop. Bishops, uh, a fund initially centered on commercializing innovations out of those institutions, uh, has uh, grown that, uh, and I guess to protect the uh, innocent, it is now named Inovia Capital, 
but has, has been successful and has a much broader investment mandate. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to our esteemed moderator uh, and thank take it away. So thank you, Tony, and thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be here at Mars and to, uh, to be asked to lead this session of uh, Entrepreneurship 101 on how to raise money from venture capitalists. It's the third year I've uh, been asked to lead this, uh, this event, and because I like to innovate, um, we will have a different format again this year. Uh, the first year we had a case discussion where a management team presented uh, their, uh, their business plan to a, a group of us who were, the, 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 I was the venture capitalist, and we asked the audience to critique their pitch and help us decide whether we should uh, invest in them or not. Um, the ne last year we had a panel of entrepreneurs who were actually fundraising at the time and we, uh, they provided their views on what was working and what wasn't working as they went through their, uh, their capital raising process. And this year I've decided, I've, I've decided to follow another format. Um, I have two of my friends here who are uh, venture capitalists and um, they're going to provide their perspective on what it really takes um, to get them to do a deal with you. Um, Tony read you their bios, but I have to tell you that, um, in my opinion, these two guys, if there was, a, if there was voting for the all-star venture capital team in Canada, these guys would both get my first place votes in their respective areas of expertise. They're incredible, ta incredibly talented guys, and I really appreciate them taking their time to come and, and, and sit with us this afternoon, especially Chris, who came to, to, to visit us from, from Montreal, uh, especially for this event. Um, now. I'm going to let you in on the dirty little secret of venture capital. And that is that venture capitalists will not tell you the real reason why they are not financing your deal. We make up a lot of excuses. We will tell you if it, the deal is too small. We'll say the deal is too big. We'll tell you it's too early stage, or we'll tell you that we wish we'd been able to invest in the earlier stage, but it's past us at this point. <laughs> we'll tell you that we have problems with potentially the size of the market, or the reaction of competitors to your, your brilliant technology. It goes on and on. We have hundreds of excuses, but the fact is, most of the time, we will not tell you the truth. That's not but, true. That's not true. <laughs> but tonight, to break through this truth barrier and so that we actually get the real scoop on what it takes to, to obtain venture capital financing, I have a, I'm going to ask my colleagues here, I have some truth serum. And I'm going to ask my colleagues to take some, have a shot of truth serum. And I think this is going to help us sort of get to the real bottom of this whole thing. Okay. Lot. Yeah, go, no, go for it. I mean, go for it. Okay, guys, so bottoms up. All right, so that's good. So that's, that's a lot of what venture capitalists do, actually. <laughs> <laughs> what was it? Is that absinthe? Or? <laughs> <laughs> no, you'll, be, you'll survive. There's no problem. Okay, so just to begin, uh, so because I think, I think it's helpful if you know the, the backgrounds of, the, of their funds and so forth. Um, I'd, like, I'd like maybe start with you, Chris, if you wouldn't mind telling me about, a little bit more about the fund and the types of deals that really, really excite you. Uh, Inovia Capital is managing $160 million worth of seed and early stage uh, funds. So we basically have one university fund uh, and two other funds uh, for which we're currently actively investing and we still have approximately $50 million of available capital to put at work. Uh, we have offices in uh, Montreal, Calgary, Edmonton, and in New York. It's uh, extremely important for us to actually have a broad uh, reach into partners, into deal flow, which are the business opportunities that are presented to us, and also into co-investors and investors for our fund. Good. Thank you. Michael. Hi. Um, so I'm from Rosetta Capital. Uh, similar to Chris, we have a broad reach in terms of our focus. We have offices here in the Mars building. Uh, we also have offices in London, Munich, and Switzerland with people positioned in those areas to see the deal flow that uh, we invest in. Uh, we have 18 investments. Um, most of them are in Canada uh, and Denmark. 
we have about 200 million under management and uh, we invest directly into companies and then we also buy companies through uh, portfolios that other VCs have invested in. So this is called a secondary deal. Uh, we do both. Uh, we look mainly in the life sciences area um, and uh, anything from therapeutics, diagnostics, uh, and devices as well. Okay, so let's start with the sort of the initial approach. What's the best way for an entrepreneur to approach you? Should they send you a business plan by email? Should they stand outside your door until you invite them in? What's the, what's the best way? Chris? I think it's about the same way I ended up here. Uh, today I had a packed day in Montreal. I wasn't supposed to be in Toronto, but Peter gave me a call last week and asked me to be here today, and I managed to be here today. So, you know, a message to entrepreneurs is that if you don't know uh, the VC community or the VCs, you know, find a way to know them. Uh, I think that like any company uh, that's trying to sell a product, they try to get a better understanding of their customers and try to actually know to who they want to sell to. It's the same thing with the, for the VC uh, community. You have to do your homework. You have to get to know who you want to talk to and why you want to talk to them. And that brings you to them. Okay, Michael, what's the um, best way? I guess what I would say is don't be shy. Um, get into our office um, through someone that you know. Um, phone us directly on the phone try and set up a meeting so that we can meet you face to face. VCs uh, are being paid to look at companies. Um, that's part of their job is to go through deal flow and see as many business plans as they can. So um, for us, uh, we've often taken a proactive approach. If we're traveling to Montreal or Vancouver, we will actually contact companies directly that we think are potentially good investments and say, will you take a meeting with us? So, uh, you know, I think it's trying to find someone you know that could act as a reference is a good idea, but um, don't be shy. Just try and contact us um, through the phone. Face-to-face -face is the best so that we can set up a meeting and meet you personally. And if I just add one little thing, I think I, continuing from Michael's comments, I think persistence is highly regarded by venture capitalists. It is by me. Yeah. Um, because it's a good indication of how you're going to conduct yourself in other business, you know, things, uh, initiatives that you undertake. So I rather like it. I, I think it's great that you keep on. Uh, and I don't think that a VC purposely tries to ignore people. No. It's just that uh, physically, technically, there's not enough time in a day, even though you, you, you reduce the number of hours of sleep, there's just not enough time in a day to look and follow up with everything that we have on our table. So persistence definitely is a big, big, big plus. Okay, so let's then talk about business plans. What's, what's the business plan format that, that appeals to you the most? Six pages or 60 pages? <laughs> uh, PowerPoint or dense prose and text? Um, and what sections of the plan do you, do you read first? If you could Twitter it, it would fit, it, your business plan <laughs> would fit in 140 characters. <laughs> and if you're smart, a part of it would actually go to your blog where you'd have more detail. And if those details are interesting enough, then you know you'd have a few attachments. But you know, I think it's actually a good way of less it. is more. Yep. Less is more. Uh, we call it a teaser sometimes or an executive summary. That's the best thing to send us by email um, because we are reviewing so many things uh, that the shorter is the better but make sure it looks professional. Um, if there's spelling mistakes, it's like sending someone your resume. If it's not formatted properly, it's much easier to press delete uh, on the email. So just bear in mind that presentation and first impression has a huge part of this process. We will then look at the executive summary and say, do you have something more? Can you send a PowerPoint? Can you send your business plan? but um, there's really no need to send a huge whacking document up front. Do, do you believe the financial forecasts? Not at all. <laughs> Not, I mean, uh, you know, we try and estimate that. I, I think uh, what I heard is that, uh, and this, we, we, we've done this before, is we'll get a financial forecast and we'll discount it by 
and that'll give us a flavor of what potentially could happen. So doing financial forecasts is important, but um, we're going to discount it anyway. And we, I, I don't know, and the companies that we've seen have rarely hit their financial forecasts based on what they've said five years ago. It's None of my companies ever did. <laughs> yeah. But what, what, what's interesting, though, uh, and I must admit, uh, I'm a university dropout, so I didn't necessarily make it to the end, but until the part that I made it, uh, I had pretty, pretty good, good grades, and I can't remember a thing. So when the teacher would say, hey, read this book, because this book is part of this course, et cetera, I would never read the book, but I'd listen to the, to, to the teacher, and you know what's going to be in your exam just by listening to what, what he's talking about, right? <laughs> so it's the forecast and everything is a bit the same thing. Uh, that's your book. So what, what the other parties want, it, what, what we want is actually to, to feel that you've done your homework, that you're actually thinking of it, that you can't, you don't have a crystal ball, but you're thinking about the assumptions and, and the, the potential business deals and you're trying to look at it from different angles. So it's more about the work behind it than the document itself. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. So now let's take a look at, at uh, the sort of criteria you use, to, you, you use when you're looking at a new deal. What are, the, what are the kind of three most important things you consider? Is it management, market size, IP, customers, valuation, speed to a liquidity event, pretty pie charts? <laughs> um, well, I've kind of ingrained five things that in, in my brain when I, when I look at something. And, and management is probably number one on the list. And that's why we like to meet you face to face, uh, because we want to know we can trust you. You're taking our money and trying to make it grow, hopefully. And that's going to be the number one thing when times are tough, whether management can pull the company around. Products are probably number two. Uh, we're in biotech, so novels, technology we're looking at. We're looking at modifying known products that are already on the market. That's an important area. Uh, after that, it really comes down to market. If there's no market for it and there's going to be no money made on the product, then it's not really worth going after. Competition, if you're the last person in the race, then there's no point uh, unless you, you know, have some other advantages. And then exit. Uh, we're all in this game to make money as VCs. Uh, Tony uh, was looking for a word. I mean, greed is a part of venture capital. It's making money. It's making money for the people who gave us money to invest as well. And, and that's really the, the, the bottom line, so how, how we can do that. Um, if, if we actually had five points, in order for us to actually be interested so into a deal, meaning that without going through the whole due diligence and properly understanding and taking the decision, just to be interested, if, if I can name five things, the first three would be actually management. Uh, management, 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 for the simple reason that we're betting on you, right? Um, we're betting that you're, not only you have the vision or your team has the vision, uh, we're betting that you're going to be able to address the challenges that you, you're going to be facing, and you're going to be facing a lot of them. You're going to, that you're able and smart enough to know which fights or which battles to fight, uh, know how to, to, to take advantage of certain opportunities. So the management part is, is you know, uh, I would say our main decision factor. Uh, the idea, if, which would be our fourth point, the idea is we, we, we try to feel comfortable with the idea. If we feel comfortable, if we think we understand what the opportunity is about and we have the right management team, then hey, you know, we're already on a pretty good first date. Uh, and the last, last part is what's the actions related behind uh, building the business? Like, what do you understand? What do you see you're going to have to do in order to actually build up a successful business? And we do see it in early stage. So we're, we're more of a, I consider our fund and our, our, the team in our fund as an old-fashioned type of, uh, of VC. We take technical risk. Uh, we, don't, we don't just evaluate, okay, what's the potential of exit and what's the potential of revenue within the short term. We do see it in early stage. So we're, all of this is going to change. The market is going to change. Everything's going to change. So we try to 
invest in good people that seem to have the right idea, ideas uh, and that can actually cause action. And I agree, management, management, management. It's like the real estate thing of location, location, location. <laughs> Um, okay, did, now having said management is so that important, does, it, does a startup company have to have a complete management team before they, they approach you? Not us, and we do see it in early stage. Um, about a third of our, of our deals are pre-revenue, pre-full management team. Another part are revenue, pre-full management team, and a small piece are actually you know, full-fledged full companies. Uh, for us, it's a question of uh, having the right people at the right time which is also really very important and critical. Uh, but we do help also our management attract. So for us, having people that understand what, what, what's missing in the team is extremely important uh, and more important than having the full team. Because if you have the full team, then you probably are spending and burning a lot of cash. So right. <laughs> there's going to be a short-term disconnect on the, the first phase. Right. Um, no, I, I agree. It doesn't have to be totally complete. Uh, usually the companies we see are a little later stage, so they'll have a CEO, they'll have a CFO, and they might have some other executives underneath. Uh, I think the other thing that uh, perhaps younger companies can think about is, is who's on your board. Uh, if you have someone on your board who's a superstar in their particular area, um, that can add a lot of credibility. Um, in terms of the overall management team, because we know how closely boards and management work at the small company level. Um, so if you bring in an expert or an industry person on the board, that can really add a lot of value, if that helps, because you don't have someone yet in the team that um, that person can fill the role of. Cool. Um, let's talk about the, the process of, uh, of, of, of approaching VCs. Should, should entrepreneurs shop their deal to many VCs while they're approaching you, while they're pitching you? Do you what, what, what's your yeah. opinion on that? I, I come from the Gas Bay Coast. So it's a very, you know, very small town. So when one guy's interested, interested in a girl, everybody's interested. That's okay. But if, if on the other hand, you actually knew that she was interested in everybody, that wouldn't be okay. <laughs> because you kind of want to feel that, you know, she thinks that you're smarter, better, for whatever reason. She did her homework, right? Well, that was true of you on the gas bay coast. <laughs> yeah. Well, so it's kind of reflected in, on, in the VC world. So if an entrepreneur does his homework well, he's basically going to discover very quickly that there's only a few VCs in Canada, and there's a bit more in the U.S., the few in the U.S. that actually invest in Canada are also limited. So he can go around the table very, very quickly. Then he has to basically do his homework and find out which one of these funds are most likely to be interested in uh, the opportunity that uh, the entrepreneur wants to present. And from there, you can basically you know, create your own lists and decide who you want to target first by prioritizing who you know, who do you have entries in, but also by qualifying who's the type of VC that you want to meet. So uh, there is an exercise to be done and there is homework to be done there. But presenting it to more than one is not a problem. Uh, shopping it around to every boy on the Gatsby Coast, that doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. I think what I'd say is you have to kiss a lot of frogs. Um, you got to just go out there and I come from a little bit of a different approach because, because I've acted on the investment banking side where we've represented companies and taken them out to see VCs. And we go through a pretty detailed target list. And we do narrow it down to those guys that might have money, that might be interested in this product. But at the end of the day, the management's got to go out and make as many presentations as possible. And I think some management think that, oh, I visited Chris. Uh, two months ago, I haven't heard back from him. Um, you know, that's horrible. I, I, these VCs are just a waste of time. You got to go see Chris five or six times before he even remembers, hey, this is something that I want to take a look at because we see so many deals that you really have to be, well, going back to my 
you know, statement before, don't be shy, is to really try and be persistent in terms of getting into the door because it takes three or four meetings before we really go, hey, this might be worth looking at. I guess I, I, I would add that uh, it is a very, the bond between an entrepreneur and a venture capitalist is very tight. It's, kind of, it's marriage-like in a way. And the fit is very important. So the quality of, in, of quality of the money and the relationship that you can establish with the venture capitalist is terribly important. Um, and in fact, there's a, one of the profs at Harvard Business School is writing a book on the quality of money and the fit issue um, right now. And so it's where you get your money and the fit is just terribly, terribly important. And, and so as Chris was saying, there's a lot of homework and a lot of relationship building that, that I'd, I'd recommend you, build, you, you, you do before you just accept capital from any source. And if I can add, um, an overnight success for a startup, a technology startup, is approximately four years. That's for the overnight success. Everybody that said, hey, this company just popped out and it's called Google and now it's popular. That's for an overnight success. All of the other businesses, and I'm not talking about the 80% that will fail, all of the other businesses, uh, it's five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve 10, 12 years before they actually succeed. The life of a venture capital fund is 10 years. We have a life. Each one of our funds has a life, fixed number of years that we can invest money, and thereafter we have to sell the shares that we bought before in order to give back the money to your pension fund so that they can pay the pensions of, of everybody else. So uh, this cycle is extremely important. So going back to Peter's comment in terms of <clears throat> the relationship, I have to understand that when, when I invest in a deal, I have to feel confident and comfortable that this guy or girl, in good or bad times, I'm going to be sitting with him. He's going to be or she's going to be calling me between Christmas and New Year's Eve because they have to lay off um, uh, a few few key employees that they really don't want to, and they have to do this and want uh, advice on this. And I mean, it's a real, real close relationship. Uh, the ones that are not a close relationships are likely the, the deals that are either going to fail or, you know, I mean, Johnny be lucky is always a good thing, but, you know, I don't really count on luck. I try to create my own luck. So uh, the relationship is extremely important. So the, the entrepreneur needs to know the VC and the VC needs to get comfortable with the entrepreneur because this is a long-term relationship. Yeah. I, I think the other thing is that uh, VCs do deals together. Um, so, so we share a common investment in one of our companies. And, um, you know, if you do your homework and find that there's five VCs that tend to do deals together, then, mm -hmm. you know, it's good approaching them or one or two because we're going to talk uh, after those meetings mm -hmm. and say, what did you think of that company? Or, mm -hmm. you know, how did you think of that management performed? Uh, what do you think of the product? And that's how we do our due diligence because we're already thinking about it. And in terms of this truth serum, that's where a lot of the truth comes out, uh, where we come up with a reason to pass. Um, I think VCs typically look for a reason not to invest because uh, that's a lot easier for us to say no. Um, and, and we'll do a lot of our due diligence through people we trust in the background and make those phone calls. So the relationship with other VCs is so important, um, your current investors and your future investors. Okay, thanks, guys. So um, now let's take a look at a, a kind of a different type of question. How do you feel about deals where there are several members of a family working in the business? For example, wives working with their husbands. Move too soon. Yeah. Okay, no problem. <laughs> Here, Chris. <laughs> I want you to have this. Michael, would you like some more? Sure. <laughs> Good one. Whoops. <coughs> Okay, Chris, you're up. It's bad. Why is it bad? Family spends Christmas together. <laughs> So every time there's going to be a hard decision to be taken, they won't take the right decision because they still want to spend Christmas together. The dad still wants to see his grandkids, and even the uncle that you don't like, you still like to see him hanging around at, 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 at home once, once a year. Me, it's a no-go. It's, it's definitely a big red flashing light. Yeah. 
I've had two deals where the hus there was a husband and wife combo, and then there was a father-son combo. It's difficult. I mean, could you fire your wife uh, and then still go home in the evening? I, I, could, I, I couldn't do that. And it's, She'd fire you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and then just in terms of your own relationship, there's no <laughs> distinction between work and life. Uh, it, it is very difficult, um, and, and we, you know, we, we kind of stay away from that. Uh, I think bringing someone else, some outside person in, will provide a different perspective and um, uh, make it a healthier working environment for everyone. But again, not every company is a VC-fundable company. It doesn't mean it's a bad company. There's a lot of great companies out there that can remain small but very profitable or become huge and very profitable uh, that don't need nor would require nor should attract any venture capital. Venture capital is a special type of financing. It's not like debt from a, a bank. It's not a grant. And we've been called by, by some researchers wanting additional capital in order to do matching for a grant that they're going to go and get. It, venture capital is unique in, in itself. And if you don't know about venture capital, please do read about it. Uh, because it's, it, it's been the heartbeat of, of, of America, at least. And hopefully, with everything that's going on today, uh, venture capital is going to be playing a big role in, in creating new jobs and bringing new innovations to the market, hopefully. Uh, but venture capital is a specific type of financing. It has a lifeline. It has a growth court curve that we call the J-curve. Uh, it's unique by itself, but it doesn't mean that a company that doesn't attract venture capital is not a, uh, a good company. It's just that it requires a specific type of company and type of growth in order to be profitable in this business. I guess my little two cents on this would be that uh, I think if you are going to work with the close relatives, you are saying goodbye to raising venture capital institutionally. Um, I think, as I think, as Chris and, and Michael have said, I think it's very difficult to go into those kinds of deals um, because the risks are just too high that you're not going to be able to do. The management team is not going to work out the way you you, you uh, thought uh, when you went in. So I think it's and it's easy. You know, when you're starting something up, it's kind of nice and comfortable to work with a, a close relative and so forth, but I, as Chris has said, I think you can have, still have a successful company, but I think you're going to have a tough time raising dough from the institutional venture capital community. And, and just a clarification, because somebody already brought this up. Uh, yes, Bill Gates was married to his VP marketing. He married her after. He wasn't going out with her when he got VC funding. And he was a publicly traded company, and then he fell, he, he fell for his VP marketing that he had, he had to fire. So just to put the record straight. Mm -hmm. OK, let's talk a little bit about cash. Um, what do you guys do to help your startups or your companies become more resourceful in their use of cash, cash being a, a scarce commodity these days? Um, do you have any examples of ways uh, startups can use, can, should try to conserve cash? And do you have, uh, do you have companies with operations in low-cost countries? Uh. Um, conserving cash is a, is a huge issue right now. Um, and uh, I mean, the hardest thing a company can face is whether it starts to downsize uh, its employee base uh, to try and keep the R&D going. Um, and, and we're unfortunately seeing a lot of that right now with our own portfolio companies. Uh, a lot of companies are being more proactive and they are um, having cost containment programs where they're challenging each of the heads or each of the employees to cut their costs by 10% in some way and they're rebudgeting for the next year. Um, and so, so that's a great way um, to try and conserve the cash. Um, we... We don't have companies in, in sort of lower cost areas. Um, mm -hmm. We're just not that, that big right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. Us, it, it, we do clean tech, IT, and uh, some life sciences. So we're, we're pretty much broad, and it's pretty much unique for each, each industry. Um, 
us as a VC, we do maintain uh, key relationships with uh, different types of service providers and we do put pressure on them so that they provide their services either with scheduled payments, and I'm talking about the law, law firms, uh, tax credits firms, the accounting firms, uh, uh, other type of, of, of services, marketing, communications as well. Uh, so we do play an active role by not pre-negotiating, but almost, you know, we as a VC firm, due to the fact that we do an, uh, a high number of, of, of transactions and our companies that are all high growth also do a lot of uh, transactions, they basically <clears throat> see us as their deal flow for the, the, for the law firm. So we do negotiate those terms on behalf of the company. Uh, but more, more internal to the company, um, if you're a software company, you should be able to do basically everything and anything that is required to actually go to market in order to have sustainable data with under a million dollars. These software companies that had to raise two, three, and four million dollars just to get their products into, into the hands of a, an initial customer, uh, they're not funded anymore. Uh, software is unique. So it's different from semiconductors and materials and solar plays that we're also doing. But just as a, as a guideline, a software company with a few hundred thousand dollars, under a million dollars, should be able to actually go to market and actually have some traction uh, in, in the market in order to raise funding with something very tangible in terms of revenue or potential revenue. Uh, a key component that made, made me successful in the past before uh, before my, my, my turn into the, the VC world uh, was really leveraging partnerships. And back in 1995, I was negotiating with, uh, with Netscape and Netscape itself was a startup and they were negotiating with AT&T and with uh, Cisco, which was also a smaller company back then. Uh, and what was interesting is that I was trying to get Netscape to pay for certain services and get free software in order to do my development from Netscape. So I was leveraging my partnership with them while Netscape was actually doing the same thing with AT&T and with Cisco and with HP. Uh, and at the same time, there was this other company called Yahoo who wasn't paying a dime in any hosting because it was hosted on Netscape servers. So leverage is everything. Leverage, in my mind, is the secret sauce uh, to, to any startup. You have to be able to leverage relationships or leverage, leverage partnerships without it costing you, other than a lot of IOUs and a lot of brownie points, it shouldn't be costing you cash. So there's a lot of ways to actually preserve cash. Cool. Thanks, Chris. So let's talk a little bit about the uh, raising capital in the current financial environment, economic environment. Um, first of all, has, has the current financial crisis had any impact on a on company's ability to raise cash? Michael. Um, I'd have to answer this in kind of a different way. With VCs, um, we have funds. So what we do is we go out to large institutions and we raise uh, money from them and then we have a fund and then we draw on that fund to do our investments. Uh, what's been happening is um, VCs uh, are just slowing really down the amount of new investments they make to really concentrate on the portfolio that they have. VCs may still have money because they had those funds committed because they are sometimes 10 years long they might have that money still around. Um, so VC deals are getting done uh, in this tough financial climate, but they are becoming more and more picky on which deals are actually going to get done at the end of the day. If you're on the public side, um, which, is, which is more advanced, that's kind of almost a non-starter right now because there really aren't any new financings getting done in the public markets. Uh, IPOs haven't happened in a long time. Um, so I think VCs are still approachable, even in hard financial times, if the funds they have, they can still draw money down from. There becomes an issue when a VC says, well, actually, you know, we've been told we can't 
invest in any more companies, then you politely say thank you for talking to me and, and try and move on to another group. So it's, it's tough out there, but I would uh, say that VC deals are still getting done. It's just pickier and pickier. Um, we're, we're, we're pretty active, so we've done uh, five, deals in, five deals in the last not even 10 months, so it's practically one every two months. Um, some cases we're the sole investor, uh, but in many cases we did have a co-investor, either a, a U.S. Uh, co-investor or, but in, I would say in maybe three of them, angel investors. So people actually, uh, the angel community coming back up to, uh, to the plate and playing an active role in the company and, f and, and, and as an investor. Uh, it is a tough uh, environment because uh, we usually would see about 300 deals uh, a year and right now we must be ranking around almost 550 for the last 12 months. So we're, it, it practically doubled because we have a lot of companies, publicly traded and private, that are just running, in, running out of cash, hitting a wall and they, they need money. Uh, and the public markets, the big problem is that for us as a VC, the public markets uh, are kind of like our exit. Those are the companies that either buy our companies or our companies actually ends up, uh, ends up on public markets and, and they do go public. Uh, that market is dead. Uh, all of the bankers in the US are called banks now. They're not called bankers. Uh, and in Canada, uh, the bankers are closing their satellite offices. Uh, right. So uh, it's, it's, it's shrinking. Um, and so that's pretty tough uh, on, on the public market front. So it does have an impact on us. And when we invest in a company today, uh, it's very, really not clear when are we going to be divesting. So when are we going to be selling? What is clear, though, is, okay, what is the company going to do with this cash? Is this enough cash in order to get him to the next step? Uh, what are all of the strings and all of the leverage uh, this company can benefit from in order to not only get through the next 12 months, but get through the next 24 months and maybe even 36 months or maybe even uh, to be in a position where it won't need any more cash and the only time it would actually go back for cash is if, he act if it actually wants to grow and have a exponential growth. Uh, but in the meantime, it can actually be a sustainable business without going there. So, we're basically trying to invest in companies that we and management understands what they control and what they don't control, like the public markets who are attracting additional capital. Uh, they realize that they don't control that part, so it's not factored into uh, the financing that we're doing. So it is hard, uh, but it is possible. And yes, there's still uh, venture capital uh, activity in Canada and hopefully we'll see even more over the next few years. And innovation, I do believe that the only way that the whole economy gets back on its feet is by bringing innovative ideas to the market and getting people to, to focus on the fundamentals. So v venture capital is the way. Okay, one last question, then we'll open, the, open it up to questions from the floor. Um, in the current economic environment, how do you find um, customers for the for uh, the products and services of early stage companies is it easier or more difficult to sell and get revenues for for these companies it must be very different between you know yeah. uh, his type Michael's type of deals and and mine but for us on the IT front more specifically uh, any company that's where it was either at the pre-revenue or the early millions of dollars of revenue uh, it's a great opportunity right now. The whole market is an opportunity for them because a lot of large corporations are hesitant to do business with a startup by default. In a good economy, like in a bad, but mostly in a good economy, somebody at, 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 at IBM, at Ford, at, at Mars, won't get fired if they hired IBM to do their IT or, or, or install that big SAP uh, software platform, they won't get fired even though it, it's over budget, they still won't get fired because they won't screw up, it's going to work. Uh, a startup, there's a risk, maybe the startup is going to run out of cash, maybe the startup is going to do a lot of mistakes, maybe the startup won't have the, the, the support to, to answer to all of the questions, etc, etc. 
So in today's world, all of these bigger companies are ready to take a risk. They have to cut. They don't have any budgets anymore. So they're ready to use a small little company and actually have their whole phone system on voice over IP with a small little company if that means that they're going to be saving money and that they don't need to cut as much in, the, in, in their staff. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity, especially on the IT front. I think that's great. Yeah, in our industry, um, we have many companies that are going through clinical trials, so it takes a long time before you're actually uh, making any money, and by then we're long gone because we, we, we've gotten out usually. Um, but our customer now in life sciences, the pharma companies, um, we are increasingly looking to um, sell our companies to big pharma. Uh, big pharma is shopping like crazy. They're buying each other, uh, Pfizer, Wyeth, Genentech, Roche, uh, and then they're buying smaller companies as well. And that provides us with an exit because we sell our shares to the larger pharma company. But it's also, uh, I think, good for a company to consider when's the best time for us to, to sell this company. Uh, a lot of companies fall in the trap of wanting to go it alone and do it themselves. And then eventually you get a merger of minnows, um, which, you know, one plus one equals one. Um, and it would have been better to have sold the company five years ago when you were on a better growth curve or whether when you had good phase two data. Um, so uh, I think our customers change, um, but uh, you know, it's important uh, to really think when you're a company, when is the right time to go, uh, not just for your VCs, but also for the company itself. Thanks, Michael. So, are there any questions that we could answer from anyone? Yes, sir. The question is, uh, how do we negotiate valuation? Um, there's, there's a harsh reality right now uh, that's troublesome for a lot of players in the whole food chain. Uh, before a private company that has a lot of growth could be compared at a discount to his com main publicly traded competitor. Right now, if he compares himself to the publicly traded company that actually has more cash than him, already have revenue, already have a distribution channel, already have, has staff, uh, he, he, he wouldn't be raising any money because he would be worth nothing uh, at a discount. He, so private transactions right now are being valued at uh, higher valuations than a lot of these publicly traded companies, which used to be one of the points of comparison with the discount, right? Um, so that is definitely a challenge. Uh, for us, it depends on the stage. A seed stage deal is not evalu evaluated the same way as an early stage deal, nor as a growth stage company, because it's not the same metrics, and it's not the same growth curve that you're going to be witnessing, and it's not the same risk uh, leverage uh, that you can evaluate either. So it is definitely a case by case. We have one portfolio company that had a few hundred thousand dollars in monthly revenue that's now generating uh, a few million dollars a month, even in this economy. Well, we pay the same pre-money value as, a, at a, as another company that now just closed 2008 at 1.9 million in, in revenue for the whole year. That was also up from nothing, but one that goes from nothing to 1.9 for the full year and the other one that goes from a few hundred thousand dollars to dozens of millions of dollars in a year, uh, why did we pay the same pre-money value? Well, at that time, when we did the initial investment, the risk, the potential, et cetera, et cetera, we came to a conclusion with the entrepreneurs that this is the value that makes sense. For us, you can't forget that we're a venture capital fund. We have a life, which means that we do try to foresee what, what and when and for how much will the exit be. So if, you're, if you, you introduce us to a company that's going to require over its lifetime, like a life sciences deal that, hey, this company is going to need 40 or $60 million of financing over its life before we can actually get our money out. 
If we're investing in day one, we're that first million dollars, well, guess what? The pre-money is probably somewhere, anywhere between 60 and 80% of the company. Why? Because when we get at the end, this company, just to be profitable, has to be worth hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars just so that we can get back our, our, our first one million dollars you know, at break even, right? So in order to actually make a profit, this company has to be a billion dollar company. Well, reality is that there's not a lot of billion dollar companies in Canada. Uh, the few hundred million dollar companies that were acquired, and I'm not talking about the rims of this world that you know, the companies ended up uh, going public and everything, but the few other M&A type of transactions that we were or I was involved in, uh, and I was lucky enough that I was involved in, uh, in, a, in a one that was over $100 million, uh, how much capital this company needed, when did they actually exit it, and what role did us, did we play as a fund in the first financing round, the second financing round, the third financing round, was definitely you know, a, a key factor for us in determining today what is the company's worth. But these are discussions that you have to have with the entrepreneur, and everybody has to be realistic in terms of, hey, what is it gonna take to get from here to there? Yes, sir. Uh, we're pretty open in the sense that uh, we do seed, seed stage deals, which are basically paper deals, uh, paper ideas. Uh, but we have to believe in the, on, in the entrepreneur, that the entrepreneur can actually take this piece of paper and actually make, build a company out of it. Uh, if the entrepreneur is thinking of its idea, but at the same time uh, requires a year and a half just to get to a prototype that he can test in the market, guess what, in a year and a half from now, it's not even the same market. So in that case, maybe it's better to wait, and when they come back with the new plan, then it becomes a more interesting deal for us. If the entrepreneur, based on its contacts, network, or what he's picking up from his old company and maybe from a few friends, and he actually is somebody that's really well known, he's a Ru Ruby on Rails developer and he's really plugged into the community and he can get this up and running beta in the customer of this partner because it's his brother-in-law that manages this company and within two months can actually have data, hey, we'll put in a half a million or a million dollars in that idea because within a very short time frame, you're gonna be up and running and you'll know how to address your business instead of burning through a million or two to actually realize that, oops, the market changed or we have to change because it didn't really work out. So, I don't know if it answers your question because it can be either, either or. Yes, sir. Ideally, the time frame is that with a few hundred K within two quarters, and I actually had a, a meeting this afternoon and the two quarter number actually came also from him. He basically said within two quarters, if the software company cannot have tangible data that the product is in the hand of potential customer, even if it's beta, it's in the hand of the customer, they have the feedback, they re revise and can address their, their product roadmap, then it's not a fundable company. So I had not looked at it as specifically being two quarters, but I think what he said actually makes a lot of sense. Um, to answer your first, the first part of your question, uh, we do help, but uh, it's really, really important to realize that um, VCs tend to get very involved in their companies, which is a very good, bad thing. The more they're involved, the more, the more 
it basically means uh, that they're not trusting you anymore because they're getting too involved. So there's a fine line, I think. And once you crossed it, it's hard to, to go back. Uh, you want to have a VC that understands your space, can call customers for you, and put you in touch. But you have to do the work. You're the one pitching to them. Uh, when I introduce one of our companies for follow-on financing to another VC, specific VC, I targeted who our portfolio company needed to talk to. I called the VC, set the meeting up. What I do is after the meeting occurred, I set it up, and after the meeting occurred, I talked to the VC to, to find out what's the truth. Why doesn't he or does he like these guys? Okay? And try to understand more about it. Uh, and then I can go back to my entrepreneur and say, hey, you really screwed it up big time. Stop talking about your, your, your failed whatever, 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 right? Um, but that's the value that we're bringing. We bring in network, contacts. We do attract management. Why? Because we have a pretty impressive database of, of, of key people that we've worked with, we know, or that we have uh, uh, some level, either a first level or second level relationship with. Uh, but we're not the ones, you know, that, that's going to be working with you on a daily base. We're not the ones that's going to be hiring and firing. And we, ha we can have an idea of the timing. A startup doesn't need a CFO at the early stage. It does do need a very good controller, though, and should be outsourcing their R&D tax credit review and uh, having a second-tier accounting firm in order to do an annual review, unless it's a required annual, annual audit. So they're advice, very smart advice, I think, that we can bring to the table. But we are not management, and you don't want us to be management, because when we are, it's because there's a trust factor yeah. that, you know, the line was crossed and... Yeah. I think the one thing I would add is the VCs may end up on your board of directors. So uh, it's good and bad. I mean, it's good to use your VCs to help with your networking, to get more money from other VCs. Mm. Uh, VCs on boards where everyone on the board is just your VCs is sometimes not a healthy environment because they're there really to just watch over their money to make sure they're not losing it. Um, it's, it's important to involve, uh, evolve that corporate governance so that you have some independent people on the board that uh, a VC may know or that you may know that might be an expert in your field so that you get a more productive um, structure in place because VCs can um, get in the way. Uh, as much as they want to be helpful, um, you know, there, there's this breakdown of trust, uh, and they really are looking to management to, to take the company forward. Mm. Yes, sir, in the back. You, please. I'll go with that one. Virtually 100% management change. 100% uh, if you include uh, the kind of top three guys, the three women, and at the CEO level, probably 75, 80%. There's a right person for the right time, right? Right. And everybody's not a Bill Gates, okay? Bill Gates started a company and got funded at the right time, went public at the right time, uh, took over the world at the right time. So, the unique. Everybody wants to be, and everybody can, you know, believe that maybe one day they'll be. And you know, look at Google. That was another another story. But uh, there's a right time and place for everybody. And once people recognizes that, I think it's a it's a it's a big big plus. But you know, I'm not ashamed about any, and I've, I've been very upfront with everybody. When I raise funds, I'm like the entrepreneur. I have to go knock at doors, do cold calls, calls uh, set up my relationships two, three, four years ahead. I'm talking right now, and I'm inviting at my AGM for Inovia investors that said no when I knocked at their door to invest in the, in the, in the last fund two years ago. Uh, why? I'm keeping that relationship alive 
because I want them to feel comfortable that they know us, they know what we're doing, they can see how we work with our companies and everything, so we're building that relationship. When they do their due diligence on us before investing, I give them reference checks. In the reference checks, there's this current CEO in the portfolio, here's a next CEO that we actually had to fire, here's a next founder that we had to also ask to leave the company for the good of the company, and they were called, and I actually had one founder, he was the founder CTO, that gave me a call and said, you got mojo, he said, do you know who just called me? A very large pension fund, and he was asking me how I, Chris, was, as a, as, a, as a manager and as a board member of his ex-company, in which he's still a shareholder, but he's not part of management because he was asked to leave. I said, yeah. I said, and what did you say? He said, well, I felt uncomfortable, so I didn't, didn't say everything that happened, but I told him you know, exactly how it happened and everything. And I think that's important. You have to develop rela real relationships. Having to fire somebody or ask them to change positions uh, is not a bad thing. It actually should be a good thing. It's just that it's hard on the ego. So that's what you have to manage. And once again, the relationship part comes into play. Yes, sir. In, in terms a hard... of cost cutting, uh, um, well, the thing, I mean, the thing with life science is that uh, if you're doing clinical trial, you need to fund that trial, right? And uh, you can't really stop it from happening. Um, so the cost cutting has to come from somewhere else. Uh, and uh, some companies are just cutting back their headcount so that they can get that clinical trial done uh, because that's really where the value in the product is going to move forward. Um, there's other ways of getting funding as well through grants that might support those clinical trials. Uh, you can do clinical trials in different ways that you can go through compassionate use through doctors um, if, if they're willing to take um, that therapeutic on board. So um, uh, there, there are some other ways to get the funding to keep that product going. Um, it's a tricky one. I mean... For, for us, due to the fact that we're at the, er we're at the first stage, right? We don't do uh, the round Bs and Cs. We actually we participate and follow on, but we're there at the beginning. Uh, what has changed in our model, even though we don't have a lot of life sciences companies, we still do have medical devices companies and a few life sciences. We have about 20-some 20, 20 companies in the, in the portfolio right now. Um, what changed in our model is that uh, management, even though they're top stars coming from, you know, was making $800,000 a year type of CEO and is the right person for this type of company, uh, he, that, that person can't, the company can't afford that person, so the compensation is more of one that's, that's equity and further equity and milestone equity, uh, therefore there's value and he's not losing out, it's just that he's not necessarily compensated in the same way. And the type of finan financing that we're putting together are also uh, evolving. As an example, we have one company that we funded because it uh, comes out of uh, one of our university partners, uh, comes, uh, comes, got a few hundred thousand dollars, uh, about a half, of a, a half a million dollars. Took two years to set up the company and the first round of financing is 20 million. We already signed the term sheet and already have 13 million around the table. We're still missing about seven million dollars. Uh, we feel confident, confident that we will, uh, but the reason why we're going from a few hundred thousand dollars to a twenty million dollar round, and we needed the full commitment of the management team in order to get there, is that twenty million dollars is going to get the company to the stage that we that we need in order to take a decision, uh, which will be okay. This company is being sold to a pharma, or there's 20 or 30 million dollars more that has to come into the company to get to the next phase. So the structure of financing is different. So we're basically you know, funding or getting the funding that's required with our participation, uh, because we can't fund the whole thing, 
to get it from A to point B fully. Like there, there won't be any fundraising in between, in between the ride. So I would say that those are the main changes. Ms. Chris? We've exhausted you. No, you're right back. Um, I was wondering, in your financial plan, how much, how much do the owners uh, of the businesses plan out for themselves as far as the salary? How do they figure that out? It's one of the toughest things my business partner and I did in our, in our financial statements. What should we actually make if we were asking for like 600 grand or 500 if, if you're an entrepreneur, that's truly building a VC fundable business that and you truly believe in the vision or the idea that you have that means that you're in this business to deliver something that can be big so you're not in this business to have short term short term gain in salary that's 50% taxable you're there for the capital gain you're there for being either bought out by a secondary or full exit with your VC uh, that means that your equity component is, the, is extremely important in our eyes. If the entrepreneur is too concerned because, and, and this is just facts of life, he has a third kid coming, uh, the house is, you know, hypothecked and a lot, and he doesn't have all of the free cash flow, well, maybe it's not the right time for this person to start a company and take that risk. Maybe he could actually be not the CEO or the founder of a company, but be part of a bigger company and have this as a pet project within the company. Maybe he can do this you know, through the evenings and eventually, when the time is right, he can afford doing it. Uh, 125K is pretty much the higher end. That's the high end. But this, this, is, this is for, for, these are not seed, seed stage companies. If you're a seed stage company and you're trying to raise 500K and you're telling your investor, yeah, 500K is gonna last me three years. Wait, wait a minute, three years? That's two years of your salary right there. Sorry, it won't fit, right? So you'll fall down, down around the 40K <laughs> at that level. But uh, if you're a company that's generating a few million dollars of financing, you're actually using the money that the company's generating with customers, then you can start spending the money in a way to grow the business and take the right decision. When you're raising capital and using somebody else's money in order to get somewhere, you better have the right plan to get there and not spend it, but be for, for the investing it instead, right? Go ahead. Um, with regards to the minimum return and your cutoff point when you're looking at the return on your investment, um, how flexible, malleable is that in light of green initiatives, positive social impact, things without sounding like a flake or a hippie? Um, is there any room for that to have an impact on your decisions? Um, no, I think it's very important. Uh, there, there are a lot of um, green equity funds uh, that are emerging uh, and uh, part of their uh, return is associated with that green part of the technology so they build that in to um, their overall return for the fund because um, the money that they've received is more green money in terms of um, what they are proposing to invest. Um, I don't know what percentage, I mean, we, we, we don't do the, the green tech investing. I'm not sure if you, you've come across that. I don't know what, what you, know, you would scale back on in terms of the green side of things. Our clean tech deals are because there's money going into the clean tech space. It's basically a recategorization of a lot of material plays. Uh, the governments are funding, you know, solar, solar cells and different type of solar parks and wind parks, and it's just an opportunity. Uh, so for us, the clean tech uh, space is, hey, there's an opportunity to actually invest in companies that can deliver a product because there's momentum behind that industry. Uh, of course, we won't purposely invest in a company that's trying to hurt the environment. Uh, and we actually have clauses in, in our LP, LPAs with our own investors in certain type of deals that 
we won't touch or cannot touch. But, uh, but that's not necessarily a factor for us in terms of the social, social clean side. I think it's a classic double bottom line. <laughs> There's, you can do good and make money simultaneously. I don't see them as, as conflicting, frankly. Um, I, think, I think it's pretty clear. Yes? Um, life science, we it would be it would be hard for us because of the amount of uh, money taken to to develop a therapeutic or a, a diagnostic. Um, we um, you know you might consider uh, doing a more of a tranche type financing. So um, you know you'll raise five million and the company will the, the VCs will give you five hundred k to start off to get to a certain point and then you'll draw down more and more so you'll you'll do a larger financing uh, which we've typically done with some of our companies because we want to we want to kind of see you get through an important value driving milestone so that the valuation goes up the next time the financing is done um, for us though 500k would be on the smaller side we would do uh, five k five million dollar financing would probably be this the smallest that that we would, we would kind of entertain. Yeah. One more question, then I think we're going to call it. Uh, if you look at the portfolio of companies that you're investing in, and you look at the kind of opportunities or the kind of uh, potential markets you see out there, um, do you ever sit down and say, gee, I would like to really have a Um, actually, some funds, um, most, mostly in the U.S., though, uh, one that I know, which is Inside Ventures, uh, they, they don't accept any deal flow. They don't want to receive any business plans. They basically map out, here, are, here is the expertise that they have within the team, and here are the spaces, and here are the players within each little ecosystems, and they basically target to find out who, which company they are in which space, and meet the, meets them all, and chooses one of the companies and offers money to the company. Basically says, "I want to invest in your company." Right? Uh, we don't have that yet in Canada. At least not that I know of proactively. But at the same time, you, you create a certain expertise. Uh, but the expertise also ties into the timing. Uh, right now, uh, there's no semiconductor deals being done. Why? Semiconductor market is crashing. I mean, even bigger, bigger crash than, than other industries, even though semiconductors are, you know, electronics in every piece of electronics that we're wearing or, and that we're using. So the, uh, we haven't done a semiconductor investment in, in, in a few years. Uh, and we actually don't have a lot of deal flow. We have a few, we, but we don't have a lot. But that's an expertise that we have. So even though we would like to have, okay, we need a new high dense, high speed type of uh, new HDMI standard uh, type of testing equipment. That's what we like and that's, we know there's a need and it's coming and the wave is going to be huge. And these are all true things that I'm saying. Uh, we won't proactively try to find that company simply because timing is just bad. So. Uh, there, there's a lot like, you know, timing Timing is everything. I did a company called, invested in a company called Popcast in 2000, right before YouTube. I had Microsoft and Intel as, as co-shareholders. That company, you know, closed the doors and we lost all of our money. 
the same year YouTube came to the market and they had the exact same thing. And the vision of the CEO was everybody's going to be a CNN broadcaster because everybody's going to be walking with their PCs and a webcam and streaming live all of the news so that you get it on the fly and you're going to be creating a huge network. Well, I'm sorry, that's what YouTube is today, but it's through phones and this and timing was bad for that investment. Uh, invested in a mobile application company that was doing what Twitter is doing right now and what you're seeing with Twitter, right? Uh, we had uh, Jacques Villeneuve, F1 card ra uh, racer, uh, sending message to his fans through SMS. But of course, he didn't want to type it in and we, we did, back then it was only uh, the bulky rims and no other uh, type of PDAs that, was, that you could connect to, to, to the, tele, the mobile operators. So his assistant would actually be sending all of these messages and everything and, hey, I just had uh, lunch at Newtown and I'm going to meet uh, whoever and whoever before going to the track. Well, that's what Twitter is in a way today, but on a different platform. So there's nothing that I could say, hey, if you had this, I'd invest tomorrow morning because it, there's, it depends on too many different things. I mean, f for us, we'd love to find the next Velcro company or the next rim in terms of biotech. Um, we don't always get it right. Uh, I mean, in terms of VC, we do maybe 10 investments. Uh, we know five of them are going to fail. We know three or four of them are going to do OK, and we know one's going to be a blockbuster. Um, we're looking for that blockbuster drug, that new technology. And those have come along in the last uh, five to 10 years. There have been some game-changing um, technologies that we've either passed on uh, and looked back and said, oh, how did we miss that? But sometimes we've gotten it right. I mean, we made an investment into Angiotech in Vancouver that uh, mm -hmm. out of the CEO's uh, master's thesis, he started to come up with a way of coding stents with drugs. And this became a blockbuster product. Uh, and we were one of the earlier investors in that. Um, it's, it's really trying to get that vision of what's going to be game changing, what's going to be the next RIM Google. Um, and, and that's why we do as many multiple shots on goal as we can. So, uh, you know, we do 10, 20 investments because we know one or two of them are going to make it big. That's great. I think that, I think we're, Tony, I think we're good to go. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you.